Hey, Frank, how are you? I'm good, Luis. How are you doing? I'm good. I love your background. It's so beautiful. Are you in a hotel? <laughs> I wish. No, this is actually my living room. Oh, it's beautiful. Living room slash way I work. And I see there's like a painting behind you. Did you make that? I did. Um, that is one of my more uh, recent paintings, yeah. So one of your recent works really caught my eye, and I really needed to talk to you about it. It was okay. a painting that you did almost in response to your mother's painting. Is that correct? That is absolutely right. Oh, my God. That's just mind-blowing that you can communicate with you know your ancestors, with generations, through art. Can you tell me a little bit about that story? Yeah. Um, well, my mom, it turns out, was quite a good artist, an amateur. She taught herself. Wow. Um, but the funny thing is, I had never actually seen her paint. She stopped painting before I was born, I think, or maybe shortly thereafter. Um, but I, I own a couple of her paintings, and I've always seen them. That particular one that you're speaking about, she had given to my uncle. And it, it sat in his dining room for many years. Um, so he died in 2009 and when he died, he gifted it to me, you know, actually he invited me over to his house. He, he was, he was not well. He knew he, you know, wasn't long for this world and he invited me over to come visit and he said, what do you want in my house? Anything you want. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he had like antiques and all kinds of things in his home. And I said, I want that painting, that painting that my mom did. And he's like, really? That's it? What else do you want? I'm like, no, that's it. That's all I want. So he gave me that. So it means a lot. It, it's really, you know, a very personal piece for me. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. Where did your mom paint it? Here in the States? She, she did. She painted it in the States. I'm not sure from what. I'm assuming possibly from a little photograph or something. Um, as I said, I'd never actually seen her paint it. You know, she had kind of a difficult life here in the States. Um, in 69, a year after I was born, my sister died. She was three years old. And I suspect that that's when mom stopped painting. You know, she kind of put her, her paints aside, yeah. Um, my father, however, was also an artist, amateur artist, um, and he continued to paint. So I think that was sort of the influence for me um, of becoming an artist. I would see him paint, you know, and kind of like, I want to do that too. How do I do that? Wow. And what drove you to, to create this bridge to your mother's painting? I don't know. You know, as I said, I have it here in my, in my place. Um, and I, I, I was always fascinated by it. I think it's a really good piece. Um, you know, she has kind of an impressionistic style. And again, to me, the idea that she's self-taught, I thought, wow, you know, that's really incredible. And, and she just had a natural talent. And what if she had kept painting? You know, how much more could she have done? Um, but I don't know. I, I just had a, an impulse, I guess, to, to create or recreate it kind of as a tribute, you know? Um, and I was very, very, um, I, I, I had a, a vision in mind of what I was going to do. Um, there's a figure in the painting, for, your, for those of you who can't see it right now, uh, there's a figure in the painting, it's a woman, I guess you would call her a, a Haitian peasant. You know, she's got a basket of fruit on her head. She's standing at the top of a cliff overlooking the valley. Um, so I wanted to keep the, the figure pretty much a, a copy of what my mother had done and then abstract the landscape more, you know, kind of in my own style so that it was a, sort of a blend of what she had done, her vision and my vision kind of coming together, you know, mother and son, I guess. So it's kind of a self-portrait. Is the figure facing the viewer or giving the back to the viewer? She has her back to you. She is facing the valley below. Wow, which makes it even more powerful, I feel. Yeah, it has a, it, it has a very strong sense of place, I think. You know, it, it's, it's in Haiti, in the, in the Caribbean. Um, I'm Haitian. That's where my parents are from. I've never been there. You know, I was born here. Um, but I, I feel that my mother painted it kind of longing for home, you know? Um, but I've always felt a very strong attachment to it too. You know, even though I've never been there, I have a strong sense of what it's like. Why, I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah. What do you think has kept you from going? You know, I, I, my parents came here in 64. And they were fleeing Duvalier, the, the dictator regime. Sure. 
they had three kids. So they came to the States with three kids who were like one, two, and uh, a month old or something. Um, and they never went back. Not to visit, not for funerals, nothing. They never went back. Um, and then they had three more kids living here in the States. So, you know, as I got older, I think in my teens, I asked my father, you know, why, didn't, why don't you go back? Or why haven't you ever gone back? And he said, you know, I don't want to. I, I don't want to go back because it's not the place I left anymore. You know, he, he was very sort of sad. You can just sense the sadness. And, and I understood, you know, it had, it had gone downhill considerably from what it was like perhaps when he was a young man. Um, but I still want to go. I want to go, and my brothers and sisters and I talk often about going. Um, but there always seems to be some something that happens. You know, there's an earthquake, or, <laughs> or suddenly there's some turmoil. In the or, or some pandemic or something. Yes. <laughs> How did you stay connected to the culture? I mean, do you speak the language? Do you have a, a large family here? I have a huge family. As I said, I have five brothers and sisters. Um countless cousins and you know, mm -hmm. aunts and uncles. Um, so I do, I understand the language probably more than I speak it, but we did like a lot of immigrant kids or uh, kids of immigrants. We speak English and their language in the house. So I understand it. I don't necessarily speak it very well, uh, Haitian Creole, but I understand it perfectly. So um, yeah, I, I, I do try to stay connected. I think it's you know? really interesting this idea of time and place for Americans um, we don't, we've never really had an experience or, or have had a reason to have to leave, right? Other than natural disasters that usually we rebuild. But during this pandemic, I really had to come to terms with this idea of like, maybe this, maybe this isn't the right place for me. Maybe I should leave New York or, or the States. Sure. And thinking about what, you know, you always think, oh, I, I can come back, but right, things happen and the places you leave change and, and. You can't go home again. You can't go home again, can you? Right. Wow. But, but yeah, it's, it's a... And that sense of longing in the painting really resonated with me on that level. And then to see you echo it, I'm just really curious about the things that you long for as an artist or in that specific painting. Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I think there's, there's a lot there, you know, I, I, I think my mother passed away about five years ago. So I think there's a longing for a connection, you know, to, to see her again. My father died about 13 years ago. Um, so there's, there is that, that longing, that sort of wanting that connection. Um, so that for sure. But ironically, I, I had a, a, a therapy session last week and we were talking about sort of trauma through through your ancestors and how that passes on to you. Absolutely. And we were discussing you know, everything that's been going on now with this whole Black Lives Matter movement and, and you know the talk of reparations and that sort of thing. Really that started with the, I shouldn't say only, but the Haitians figure very strongly in that story. You know, it's it's the first nation where this the the enslaved people revolted and won mm -hmm. against their, their enslavers. The enslavers, however, demanded reparations for their lost property. So Haiti had to pay back to France the equivalent of maybe billions of dollars today, well into the 20th century. You know, so, and for me personally, and, and this is where, you know, <laughs> what I'm going through in therapy right now, is somehow, you know, my... I'm a light-skinned black man. I'm, I'm multiracial, European, French, African, the enslaved people in Hades, in Haiti, and and uh, native people, which I guess are the Taino Indian. Um, so a combination of all of those, you know, my ancestors are the slaves and the enslaved, or, or and the slaveholders, I should say. Wow. I went online once a, a while back um, to the Schomburg Center, and you know looking up various historical papers, you know, see what I can find on my history. And I found an actual document. Wow. It said, you know, uh, I forget his first name, but it was one of my ancestors, you know, Mr. Hoagland, um, 200 slaves, and he was selling so many to his brother. Yeah, and it's one thing to, to know it in your mind that, yeah, you know, I'm descendant of both of these. 
But to actually see the paperwork, the proof that, holy cow, wow. How, and how do you process something like that? So it, it can be a crisis, but it doesn't become a trauma, right? How do you process that? What, what, what tools do you use? Part of it is just, you know, kind of coming to an understanding of this is it, this is real. And this is what we're talking about right now. I think for me, all of what's happening right now is very personal. Mm. You know, you may not, you may look at me, you know, we may cross paths on the street. You may not know he's Haitian, he's black even, but you probably think I'm Latino. At the very least, you know, you're, you're thinking this is a person of color. Um, but I've, you know, I've, I've kind of experienced all of those things that we're talking about um, in terms of, you know, being stopped by the police, being questioned, being followed in the store, you know, it feels like it's been a lifetime of processing. Um, I'm still processing it. And I think I'm using my art, you know, definitely to kind of um, find some, some calm, I guess, in this craziness. You know, that's what the art does for me. Absolutely. I, I, I think of it as the great American reckoning, you know, um, and it, it, I think when it, when the White House occupant came to power, um, the thing that enraged me the most was that people were surprised. Like they didn't see it coming. They didn't know that this was what was happening, that this could happen. And like you said, living this experience on a day-to-day -day basis, being invisible, being, uh, overlooked, all of these things were just like, what? How, what do you mean you don't, you didn't see it? I mean, that, that, that oh, yeah. was a sense of enragement, right? Um, at this point in time, it's almost like I'm playing the violin as the ship is, you know, sinking and on fire. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't think black people were that surprised, you know, when he got elected, <laughs> they weren't surprised. It was like, yeah, that makes sense. Because it had to be, it had to be the opposite of okay. Barack Obama, you know, and he literally is the polar opposite, you know, obviously black and white, but scandal ridden, whereas Obama had no scandals, you know, he's got, what, five children by three different women that he's cheated on, you know, he's on his third wife. Imagine if, if Obama had one half of, of the history that he does, a third, or even just one, it, it would not be the same. And that's true in general. We, we understand that, right? I went to school with, I, I went to prep school here in Queens. It was a predominantly white school. All the black and Latino kids could fit at like two tables in the cafeteria, and we did. Um, but we always sort of understood that we had to be doubly good to get half as far. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, so we understand, and we saw that with Obama. He was doubly good but he's not gonna, you know, he's not gonna be given the same passes that someone like the current orange occupant would uh, will get and does get. Yeah, I think it's really interesting uh, because, yeah, that, that's that's a very uh, that's an experience, right? That that you understand that you're gonna have to work twice as hard to get your, your minimum, uh, the minimum attention, the minimum recompensation, the minimum reward. Uh, and there's a certain uh, tax. It's taxing when, when you have to operate that way because you realize that you, exactly, while you can do it, a lot of the people around you can't for whatever right. reason, right? So there's like, there's this almost a survivalist guilt attached to that sometimes. Do you find yeah. that? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, and, you know, I, I think we said it's, it's exhausting. You know, at some point, when is it going to stop? You know, it's like, okay, I've been doing this for a while. I'm 52. You know, when? When do we no longer have to, you know, work so hard just to get the same recognition? You know, art, being in the art world, is it's a, it's a notoriously, you know, ra I don't want to say racist. Oh, it is, though. Oh, of course. Oh, my God. It's, yeah. I, I think the way it's set up, you know, with the galleries and the gallerists and, you know, who qualifies as an artist, who's worth this much money, um, is very rooted in race. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I don't just mean fine art, you know, painting, dance, music, you, you name it. 
And that's what I think, you know, has come to a head and everyone's trying to, to, to bring an awareness to now. It's like, oh, now you're starting to see, yeah, we know this. This is not new. I mean, I think that's the exciting part for me. Like right now we can literally choose how to operate moving forward, right? How do we operate in a way that doesn't tender, that doesn't play to the galleries, to the museums, cancel all your museum memberships, fuck MoMA, yeah. fuck the Met, fuck the Whitney. I mean, I, I'm here cursing. I never curse in my <laughs> You know what I mean? I brought that out in you. <laughs> you totally did. You're so, you're so like, you know, Zen, but here I am. You're, you're opening my rage. Um, fuck them all. Fuck them all. But the thing is that that's, that's the calling, right? How do we operate? And I was, I'm reading um, Pleasure Activism, and it's just blowing my mind. Uh, okay. And I read something in it, and I can't remember who said it. I'll look it up. But they say something to the effect that how you cannot rebuild or reconstruct something using the oppressor or colonial uh, patterns, right? Or as a source of reference. Like, we have to think outside the box. We have to think, like, okay, what do we do with our resources not, yeah. not, you know, if we're thinking about art, it can't be the empty white wall, exclusive VIP collector circle. Right. And it's tough to imagine that because we have no idea what that looks like. Right. And it's, and, I, and it still needs to be able to feed you, right? And, and feed me and, and keep the energy moving and flowing. For sure. You know, for me, I, I'm, I'm, as crazy as it all is, I, I'm actually kind of hopeful. Yes, you know, absolutely. I, I, I get a good sense right now that this is a good time for the change to happen. You know, it seems kind of crazy with who's in the White House, but I think that in, in large part, that's what drove this. Um, and I feel like we have to ask for more. Yes. You know, don't just ask for this and it's enough for right now to appease you. You know, no, more more because this is not it's not about greed it's about you know the momentum and keeping it going you know reparations what does that mean or you know does that just mean maybe just some equality you know how about some you know we probably we may have to go back to some affirmative action type program but but more you know more like the galleries need to be aware that you don't have any black artists on your roster you know or in the boardroom or in your boardroom, right? Or working the floor, you know, the, the salespersons, whatever. More, more. Let's not don't, don't just pick one and think, or you know, don't just post a black square on your Instagram. It's a nice start, but not enough, you know. So I want everyone to kind of keep going and, and do more, and I think it will. I, I I kind of feel it's the younger people, absolutely, who are going to drive this because they they're entering a different world, you know. A lot of these 20 and 20 somethings, they don't really know any president other than Barack Obama and Donald Trump, you know? So for them, the future is long. For me, not so much. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I, you know, I just said, oh, we need to do something completely different. But at the same time, we have to know the language of these politics so they don't use it against us, right? right. All of these things that, uh, have been happening are kind of in the playbook of business, you know, like this whole idea. So we're going into conspiracy theory territory right now, you know, all of these firecrackers, right. And they're saying, Oh, it's the police because they're creating a fire that only they can put out. And you think, Hmm, well, where would you get that? That's in every business book. Create it, right. Create a need for your service. Yeah. So I think we really have to be versed in their arse, you know, their arson, their, their, all these plays that they've used over and over in business. So yep. we know when it's being used against us. The playbook. The playbook, exactly. And we need to write our own playbook. Yeah. And I think that's happening. I think, you know, as I said, I, I'm hopeful that that's going to, it has to change. There's no choice, you know, and it's, it, it, it just has to, you know, the population is changing. White people aren't going to be the majority much longer. Things are going to have to change just 
by default. By default, yeah. Well, yeah. well, let's not wait by default. But let me ask you, right. going back a little bit, uh, what was <laughs> what was your first um, experience with art? What was the first work of art that you saw that that kind of cemented the deal for you? Uh, like I said, my dad would paint. You know, I was a little boy, um, and that was his thing. He would pretty much on the weekends, he you know get out his canvases and paint. Uh, he was also a very good photographer. He had a dark room in the basement. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I was, you know, standing right next to him. I could smell the chemicals right now. You know that vinegary yeah, smell. Yeah, I could smell it too, gross. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was really my first exposure, and I, I think I, I just knew, like, that's what I was going to do. That's what I wanted to do, and I would beg and plead. You know, he wasn't the type to really sit you down and say, okay, here's how you hold a brush, and here's what you. He didn't do that. Um, but, you know, he, he would give me a, a brush and, and some paint and, you know, go ahead, do what you want. So, um, but I did beg and plead one, you know, I was probably like eight years old. I want my own set of paints and brushes and canvas. You know, I want my own. We didn't have a lot of money, but he did it. He bought me, you know, the grown up set, not the kiddie set, because I didn't want yeah. that. One. You know, I wanted the real set with the real colors. Um, and that was sort of my intro to it. Do you know about his entry point into art? I, I don't, you know, that's, that's a good question. He, he, he was an architect by trade. So, you know, that's an artistic field. So I'm sure he just always sort of naturally had the inclination, but no, I, I never knew. It's you really know, interesting. Kind of, I wonder if your mom and your dad ever collaborated other than making you obviously, but like what, what <laughs> other, I wonder if they ever, you know, they did. Um, my mother did tell me that they used to have little competitions, so they would paint the same scene together. Oh, that's so cool! You know, and then each do it their own way, which is something you do in art school too. You know, you go on a, a, a plein air painting, and it's you know all these artists painting the same scene, but in their in their own differing styles. So they would do that. Yeah. Do you have any of that? I don't. That's interesting. I don't. I, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened to those pieces. I'm always curious to see how kind of certain art traits or art practices kind of go in through generations you know i remember once my grandmother gave me a book and she's like here this was your grandfather's and i'm like okay and i, I was looking through it it was a spanish french dictionary and i was like huh like he studied french he's like oh yeah he was he it was a francophile i was like I'm a Francophile. I never met this man. I never heard, you know, I've never, we had no connection other than blood. So right. to see these things jump, you know, naturally is really yeah. fascinating. Do any of your brothers and sisters also make art? Yes. My younger brother is an artist. He's a graphic artist. Um, I think they all have a natural talent for it. I remember them using it more when they were kids, you know, sketching comic book characters, yes. that sort of thing. Um, but we are the only two that actually pursued it. Uh, as careers, um, but they all have like a natural ability for music, guitar, drums, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, but as I said, we, we, we are the two who decided we're going to make a living at this or not. <laughs> nice, nice. And I know you're in a very, you have, you're part of a few communities. Uh, you used to go to um, life drawing sessions, is that right? I do, I still do, yeah. Oh, do I, they still go on? I do. I, nice. The um, long... Island, uh, it's LIC Arts, and it's a gallery, but there's also, a, it's a community of artists, and then once a week they have, you know, a three-hour drawing class, open drawing class, and that's great to kind of just keep your hand up, meet other people, meet other artists, you know, what I particularly like about it is it's, it's very freewheeling, you do what you want, you come in if you feel like doing markers or pencils or paints, that's what you do, Wow, uh, and that's great. But I've also taken some courses too, you know, just to kind of keep um, my hand up and learn some new things. I've taken some courses at the Art Students League. Um, a couple of years back, I took a class with um, an artist named uh, Dominique de Medici or Medici. Hope I'm getting her name right. Mm. But it was a, a course, you know, it's about five, I think it was five days, um, focusing on the Zorn palette, which was something new to me. The Zorn palette is like five colors, you know, red, blue, yellow, black and white, um, which was a challenge, but I loved it. Yeah. And even though I don't necessarily limit myself to those five colors now, I do try to paint with no more than, you know, five or six. Um, and 
I'm like, wow. It's almost as if I've been reborn. It's like, oh, wow. I didn't know you can do all of this with five colors. It's you know, amazing. I've been, spending, I've been spending boatloads of money on all these different color paints and oranges and browns. And, you don't have to. It really teaches you to be resourceful, doesn't it? Yeah. I feel like... And also, you get a more unified final product because you're using those same colors. You're not suddenly reaching for something new you know, out of your, your deck right. because you need a, co a different green here and suddenly something's off. Yeah, and it also shows your idiosyncrasies and preferences with, with certain colors and certain keys and values. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like right now we're living through our, our Zorn palette, right? With the limited resources yeah. we have, we're like, oh, I can, I can be okay with just 10 rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> right. Also, because I can't go out to the art store and get another tube of burnt umber, so I'm going to make my own. I miss that. But can I tell you, I just got an email from Housing Works. They're reopening tomorrow, and I might be there early in the morning to get in. Because <laughs> I'm a collage artist. I miss having stacks of new old books, you know? You, I was going to say, you probably go in there and get all the books. <sighs> and, uh, and statues and whatever I find. So I, I, might, uh, I might be the first one in line tomorrow. Hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which location do you go to? Brooklyn? Uh, no, I go to the one in Columbus Circle, which is ridiculous. But I, I make a whole day out of it. So I'll, I'll go, you know, through Central Park. Then I'll, I'll cross the park, walk into uh, Columbus Circle, and just kind of make a day out of it, get my coffee, walk around, go to Kiehl's. Awesome. You know, um, which I don't know how possible it is to do now, but I can try. Yeah. I can try. <laughs> I think it'll happen. I think you'll be all right. You may have to stand on line to get into the store. Which is something I don't do, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. Bring a mask and bring gloves. Oh, I hate lines and I hate gloves. But yeah, well, definitely. What I'll send you my old books. How's that? Oh my God, yes, please. Um, <laughs> don't tease me because uh, I'm going to call you like at 12 p.m. today or tomorrow and be like, where are my books? Yeah, you yeah. promised. <laughs> what is keeping you motivated these days? What are you reading? Or watching? Oh, I just picked up a book called Old in Art School. Ah. It's, it's by a woman named Nell Painter. And um, I, I just randomly... Her last name is Painter? Her last name is Painter, <laughs> yeah. I know. Funny. And the, the, the basic premise of the book is it's an autobiography of sorts, a memoir. Um, she's actually... A his, uh, she was a history professor at Princeton for many years of renown. She wrote books... Um, pretty, pretty, uh, you know, New York Times bestseller books. But in her 60s, I guess about age 60, she retired from Princeton teaching and decided, I want to be an artist. I always wanted to be an artist, and I wonder if I can do it. And she didn't just pick up a canvas. She went to RISD. Okay. <laughs> yeah. she, she enrolled in classes, I think first at, at uh, Rutgers undergrad, and then she went to RISD for like an MFA. But she did it. But the, it, it's basically her experience of being in art school in your 60s, you know, and these, these like 20, 18 year old, 20 year olds coming up to her and going, How old are you? <laughs> you know, and also she's a black woman, ah. so she's kind of giving her experience of being black, female, and older, and what she's gone through. You know, she had one professor who basically told her, You'll never be an artist, you might be in a gallery. But there's, you know, a gallery, will, there's always a gallery for somebody. It doesn't matter what kind of quality it is, yeah. And really kind of putting her down and, and, you know, as an instructor herself, she knew that that's not the right thing to say to motivate a student. And I think it helped her, though. You know, it was very much, uh, I'll show you. Yeah. Kind of the situation. What was your education so I'm not like? I haven't learned the book yet. But, what, was, sorry? what was your art education like? My art education, I went to a pretty ordinary high school here in, in New York. I'm actually that rare breed, born and bred in New York. Wow. Um, yeah. I've always said, like, if I was born in Montana, I probably would have wound up in New York anyway. I so, so. I like it here. I stayed here. Yeah. But I went to a pretty ordinary high school, but I took a lot of art courses there. And I was fortunate. I had some good art, art instructors there. Kind of, you know, said, hey, if you're really interested in it, take more classes and they encouraged me to take some weekend classes at Parsons. They had programs for high school kids. And I got into Pratt. And so I went to Pratt to study fine art. Um, suddenly, being the one of the best students, art artists in high school, you're not one of the best <laughs> when you get to art college. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> oh, not always, art. yeah. Yeah, those kids are really good. Um, and I think I, 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 I probably got into a little bit of a pattern or... or of um, 
I'm not going to make a living at this. You know, I, I, my, my parents were definitely worried, you know, because parents from the Caribbean are kind of like, you can be a doctor or a lawyer. Mm. Um, this is not really art. That's not a, that, that, that's a hobby. That's not a job. So I think they, they sort of encouraged me to do something a little more practical. And that's how I wound up being an interior designer. I decided to change my focus, my major, into interior design, figuring I can always still, you know, I can still paint, I can still make art. Interior design is still an art, you know, I, I brought all my senses into play, my sense of color, my sense of 3D, you know, how you move through a space. So it wasn't as if I was wasting my art skills. Um, and I had a pretty good career as an interior designer. But in the last few years, the last decade or so, I really have kind of come to that place that I think you know, Miss Painter was of that's not really what I want to do anymore. Hmm. I want to be an artist and I'm redirecting my focus into kind of doing that, you know, as much as possible. It's not full time yet, but it's at least, you know, I'm, I think I'm getting a 60%. Nice. What a great feeling, right? I'm sorry. What a great feeling to move towards that. Yeah. And it, it doesn't, it, it, I don't think I would have been able to do it in my younger years. I can do it now. You know, you have, you're a little older, you have a little more discipline. You know, I, I've been basically self-employed as an interior designer for a while. Um, it's not that different. You know, it really is just about showing up. If I don't show up for work, I don't get paid. Yeah. If I don't show up and paint, I can't sell a painting because I haven't made a painting. You know, it's the same idea. So it's not that hard to, to do that if you have the discipline to do it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect at it, but I certainly understand that aspect of it. Um, and, and yeah, I, I realize I can show up. I can show up and I'm enjoying it. It's, it's, it's great. It's what I love doing. What has been the biggest surprise in that move? The biggest surprise is that, well, learning um, social media. It's kind of a new thing for somebody who, you know, not that I'm that old, but that definitely is a game for these kids in their 20s. If you're not a millennial, it's just, it's not as, you know, if you weren't born with a computer in your face, it's just a little yes. bit different. It's not yes. as intuitive, I feel. So that is, to me, the, the, the biggest learning curve is how do you do, how do you post <laughs> these things every day, you know, over and over? But I have to say that, that, that when I do it, I get some feedback, and I've sold a couple of pieces just through that. And it's like, oh, wow, that wasn't that hard. Yeah. I just had to take a decent picture of it, crop it, resize it, post it, done. You know, figure out all the hashtags. <laughs> you know, hashtag this, at that. Um, but, yeah, I've managed to, to sell that. And I, I'm, I think that's another thing that gives me a lot of hope is maybe we don't need those galleries anymore. Not in the same way. You know, you can you can control your own your own um, I guess channels out there. Yeah, there's so many ways to navigate a career in art, and I think you know we've learned that it isn't just this person behind an easel in a room waiting for a curator to knock the door. Like there's all of these other things that you can do and kind of have to do, and you can enjoy them, like social media, like taking classes, you know? Yeah. The freedom to do it and do it whenever you feel like doing it. If I don't feel like painting this morning, I can do it tonight. You know? Right. Yeah. What do you think the biggest business lesson from your interior design, from all of your other careers, what's, what's the career, what's the business acumen that you can bring into your art practice that can help? Um, I think two things. I, I would say it's, it's to kind of know your client, you know, listen to them, still be true to yourself. But even as a designer, interior designer, it's still my art. It's my vision. It's whatever, you know, I kind of want to gear it towards what, how they live, but it's still, you know, my vision. Um, so it, it, in a way it's like with art and painting, it's paying attention to what people respond to. Right. You know, it doesn't mean I'm selling out, but this is sort of what people are responding to. I like doing it. Let me try a little more of that, you know? Um, and then the other thing I think is to just be persistent. Mm -hmm. Really, really be persistent. Um, my dad used to teach Latin and he, he once said to me when I was a kid, a kid, 
Guta Kava Idem, which is dripping water hollows out a stone. And it's not with force, but with persistence. Wow. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. It's just, you know, slow and steady wins the race, however you want to put it. Yeah. That really is what it is. It's just being persistent and, and you, can get, you can get there. It's taken me a few years, but <laughs> you can get there. Be persistent. That's pretty sage. I think it's also really interesting that I think perhaps this new generation is not going to have that block of having to be unique and having to only make art for yourself because I think that's a big myth that was driven yeah. on everyone before social media. After social media came, you know, you, you kind of realize, oh, wait, it, you get more uh, attention by connecting with people, right? Not just by being, like, insolent and being, this is me and this is, I'm the special one, right? Right. I think that, that that was such a big myth. That was such a big thing to get over. And I think social media has allowed people to, to kind of figure that out. Like, no, it's all right. about connection. It's all about putting it up and, and uh, connecting it to the right people, like you said. Yeah, true. I think, you know, for you, you even mentioned that you, that, that post that I did on Instagram that caught your eye. If I didn't put that story there, would it have still caught your eye? If I didn't put the explanation of, you know, this is my mother's painting and this is my version of that painting. If I just put them there and, you know, put 2020, you know, the year I did it or something. Um, maybe not. And that's something I've, I've also learned. It's like, because I had been doing that. I had been just posting images mm -hmm. without really explaining or putting a story there. But I'm realizing, too, that the story is also the selling point. Absolutely. Oh, and, and the connection. Yeah. Yeah. People love stories. That they do. <laughs> well, I'll make some up. <laughs> now, to close, I kind of want to ask you a weird question. Do you, mm. I like weird questions. Who will you give your painting to of your mother and the one that you created? Oh, I don't Oh, wow. I don't know. You're going to make me cry because now I'm like, I got nobody to leave it to. <laughs> right? I, I mean, I... I think about this often, you know, and, and I have no children myself as a gay man. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but it's expensive and it's complicated. Um, but I think, wow, like, how, how, does, how, how does my legacy yeah. carry on, move? right? How does it move on? And I have sisters, I have a brother, uh, but yeah. I have, yeah, I have 20 or more nieces and nephews at this point in my life, so it'll probably go to one of them. I have this vision in my head that they're all going to be fighting over my artwork because they want it and they love it. Maybe not. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I would imagine that that's where uh, hopefully they would end up. and ideally maybe end up together, you know, now as a pair, you know, kind of traveling together. Well, when the time is right, I think you should have a competition. Have them all paint the same painting like your parents did. And the one who has it the best gets to keep them <laughs> all, including yours. I thought you meant like, you know, two men enter, one man leaves, kind of a <laughs> duel to the death competition. Hey, if that, if that sounds more practical, go for it. But uh, hey, We're exciting anyway. Right? But I think that'd be adorable to see everyone paint a version of that painting as a family. That'd be so I love cool. that idea. I think I'm going to give that a, let's give that a shot. Right? They have some talent too. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? That'd be so much fun. Well, Frank... Thank you so much for sitting with me and chatting. It's such a pleasure to talk to you and get to... Yeah, thank uh, you. It's been great fun. I, I'm so glad. And I can't wait to see uh, what else you create and what other stories you tell on Instagram. <laughs> on Instagram, yes. Ciao. Just don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call you at noon for those books tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> All right. Take care. Ciao.